Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about the value of reading and lifelong learning. I'm delighted to welcome America's leading reading ambassador, Dr. Danny Brussel. Dr. Danny is a highly sought after speaker, trainer, teacher, coach, best selling author, and the co founder of The Reading Habit the world's top reading engagement program. You can learn more about Dr. Danny and his amazing program at the website freereadingtraining.com where you can get a free ebook, Read, Lead, and Succeed. And I'll include a link to that website in the description. Welcome, Danny. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Thanks so much for having me, Linda. Thanks for all you do to spread some joy, much needed joy around the world. Thank you. We do need some joy. We need joy every day and we can bring it. And that's the exciting thing is that we have the power to do something about the joy in our lives and our success in our lives. Now, I checked out your website and it had an opening question in these big, bold letters. And it sounded a little bit like the opening line of a joke. And I (laughs) thought, oh, that's kind of appropriate because I know that you use stories and humor in your um, in your message to get this word across that reading is a good thing and to help kind of make that popular again because we oftentimes take an easy route and just watch a video or do some other way. So let's go ahead and ask that question, which I know isn't a joke, but it does kind of sound like that opening line. What do Elon Musk, LeBron James, and Pitbull have in common? Yeah, they, they all are very good readers. They read a lot. And that's what I always tell people is that uh, there's plenty of readers that don't necessarily become effective leaders, but I've never read about an effective leader in any, any endeavor, whether it was business or athletics or government. I've never read about an effective leader that was not an avid reader. And uh, uh, I could have kissed LeBron James when he was playing for the Miami Heat. They showed him in the locker room before the NBA finals, and he was reading uh, The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. Oh, I'm like, that's great. More for reading with that one shot than I can do my entire lifetime. It was wonderful. That is true. They have some power behind their words and behind their examples, and that makes a big difference. And reading makes all of the difference in the world. I remember reading this story about um about Ben Carson and his experience and how he talked about when he was in fifth grade he was the worst student in the whole school and he said by seventh grade he was the top student in his school and the difference that magic that happened between fifth and seventh grade was his mother and this wonderful hardworking woman who's you know single trying to make a living by cleaning houses and she realized with this epiphany hey all these houses that I'm cleaning, they have bookshelves. They have books. These people read. I wonder if there's a correlation. She came home from work, turned off the TV and said, guys, you're watching too much TV. From now on, we're going to limit the programs. You're going to go to the library. You're going to read two books a week. And from here on out, I want to report on those two books. And of course, the kids balked, but she held them to it and it made all the difference in the world. And he went on, of course, to get a scholarship to Yale and to go on to medical school and to become a pediatric neurosurgeon and then an influencer and politician and all these amazing things because he read and that was the beginning. And I think that's the the empowerment that you're trying to offer to people is, hey guys, this really does make a difference in people's lives. So how do you help people to to want to read? I mean, we have problems of illiteracy where people can't read and then there's illiteracy where you can, but you don't want to. So so how do we overcome these barriers? Well, that's a great question, Linda. Thanks for asking it. It's kind of ironic because I've, I've lived that customer journey because I grew up hating reading. Uh, my father was a public librarian, and I always hated the public library. It always right. smelled funny. The furniture <laughs> was always uncomfortable. There was always some elderly woman telling me to be quiet. There's always some freaky homeless guy who thinks he's a vampire hanging out in the public library. <laughs> And it wasn't until I actually started teaching in the inner city in South Central Los Angeles where I noticed a lot of my students didn't have the advantages that I had growing up. And I said, shame on me. I mean, I was very blessed, Linda. Both of my parents were in the home. Uh, we, We were a lower middle class family, but we always had food on the table, so we didn't have to worry about eating. And my parents read to us, in front of us, and we always had plenty of access to reading materials. And I thought, wow, I really took for granted a lot of the advantages I had. And so what I started noticing in schools, Linda, is that schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question I always ask people is, what good is it teaching kids how to read if they never want to read? 
I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read a book. I want them to choose to do it on their own because they love it. There's some simple tricks that I train parents in my program just takes a little bit over two months where, you know, our, our data has shown that the typical kid that goes through our program improves their reading ability by two to three grade levels, which is all fine and good. But what inspires me, what, what really touches my heart is that kids that leave our program now love reading and they'll do it for a lifetime, not just because it was for a school assignment. And the little secret a lot of people don't know is four out of five of our struggling and reluctant readers are boys. Uh, boys and girls are very different. Little girls will read books about little boys. Little boys don't like reading books about little girls. I mean, there's some there's some exceptions. And so I'm always uh, trying to show parents and teachers some really quick strategy. And I mean, believe me, I have plenty of strategies for the girls that don't like to read too. But in my experience, it's usually the little boys that uh, struggle. I mean, you, you see that just developmentally. When, uh, when I was teaching first grade, you give me a six-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy and I can almost guarantee you that girl is a couple of grade levels above that little boy. I mean, the boys tend to eventually catch up, at least some of them do, um, but it takes a little bit of a while for them to mature. And so there's just, I like to give people practical things that they can use to get their kids excited about reading, because the more excited you are to read, the more likely you are to read, and the more you read, the better you get. So that's a long answer to your short question. No, 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 no. I love this long answer. And so I'm so excited to hear what is the magic of what is it that you're that you're doing that's getting people excited, excited to pick up a book and excited to read something, especially boys. That's great, Linda. I mean, so one of the best tips I give to parents and uh, teachers is you have to eavesdrop. Uh, you know, I was watching a teacher with a little boy and she asked him, uh, well, what's his favorite sport? And he said soccer. And she's like, well, I like basketball. So she started reading him a basketball book. And I'm like, you didn't listen to the kid. You just said soccer. Read him <laughs> you know, I, I always tell people our research is really clear on this. It doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. It doesn't matter if you're reading James Joyce or James and the Giant Peach. People who read more read better. I always tell people the little boy who only reads Captain Underpants is going to be a better reader than the little boy who refuses to read anything. Captain Underpants is the gateway drug to Shakespeare. But first of all, you got to get the kid hooked. So it's the most basic tip that I can give parents. And what I'm always trying to show parents is... Uh, there was a study done around the world, and they were trying to figure out characteristics of successful students, and they found something that startled them. It was the number of minutes spent reading outside of school. So they looked at the low students, the medium students, and the high students. They found that low students testing in about the 20th percentile at the bottom of the class average less than a minute a day of reading outside of school. That's not too surprising. That's probably why the kids at the bottom of the class. But this did startle researchers, the kids in the middle of the class, the 70th percentile, the C students, the average students, they average 9.6 minutes a day reading outside of school. So when I'm doing a live training with parents, this is when the room gets really quiet and the first hand raises and the parent says, wait a sec, are you telling me if I can get my kid to read 10 minutes a day, I can take him from an F to a C? That's exactly what I'm saying. The research is pretty conclusive on this, but what's really startled the researchers were the kids in the 90th percentile, near the top of the class, do they spend three hours a day reading outside of school? No. Do they spend one hour a day reading outside of school? No. The average was just over 20 minutes a day. My job is to show parents ways to get that kid to read 20 minutes a day. And there's two great things that people need to know. First of all, being read aloud to is just as good as reading on your own. So one of the simple tips I'll tell parents is if it takes you 10 minutes each way to drive your kid to school, Put in an audio book so the kids are listening to books back and forth to school. You just covered your 20 minutes right there. And then the other thing that's nice is the minutes don't have to be consecutive. So if you only have a minute here, a minute there, just integrate them throughout the day and you'll be able to uh, fulfill your minutes that way. That is magical. What you have done is given hope that it's possible. Because I think the idea that people have is you have to spend three hours a day or, or whatever in order to have any kind of results. And that is magical. And if you can use an audio book to get those similar things, I mean, how many of us are spending time in the car? How many of us are trying to get from point A to point B? And we spend a lot of our time in transit. And if that can count for that 20 minutes, then all of a sudden there's hope. 
that this can include me too. And this is something that is possible for anyone. That's magical. Well, and, and you had met, you had mentioned the difference between illiteracy and illiteracy. Illiteracy means you can't read. Illiteracy means you won't read. I typically work with a lot of people that won't read, but there are illiterates out there. And here's what people have to understand. There's lots of reading disabilities that go undiagnosed and every reading disability is curable. Probably the most prevalent uh, reading disability is dyslexia. And if you actually look at uh, the Fortune 500 CEOs, over half of them are dyslexic. And what oh, people don't understand cool. is dyslexics, they don't process things visually the same way all of us do, but they're very good auditory. And it's one of the best tips I give for dyslexics is listen to audiobooks. It's a great way to get your reading done um, through audio. I mean, you, and there's, you're in good company if you're dyslexic. Uh, you got business leaders like uh, Richard. So Richard Branson is dyslexic. You got entertainers like Tom Cruise and Whoopi Goldberg and Sylvester Stallone are all dyslexic. Uh, President George Washington, most people believe, was dyslexic. So uh, uh, there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I don't like negative labels. If you're going to take the time to label a person, you might as well label them a genius because people rise or fall based on the expectations. So uh, uh, there, there is help. I mean, one of the most basic tips I give, Linda, I, I work a lot with uh, uh, parents and teachers in under-resourced areas. And a lot of parents will say, I have nothing to read at home. I'm like, oh, oh, I bet you to do. Uh, here in the United States, President Bush Sr., over 30 years ago, signed a very important law in this country that says every television set sold in America has to have closed captioning. So here's the tip for parents. Turn on the closed captioning on the television. And people will say, well, wait a sec. If the show's in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make this point. Have you ever watched a TV show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? That's so very difficult to do. Your brain is directed towards that captioning. And there's actually research to support this. Uh, if you look at worldwide studies, the more kids watch TV, the reading scores always go down in every single country except for one. The country that watches the most TV in the world has the highest reading scores in the world. It's Finland. And people ask, well, how can that be? I'm like, well, because Finland makes really bad TV shows. And so what they do is they import all these old sitcoms from America, like Happy Days and you know, uh, Welcome Back, Cotter, and the Brady Bunch. And they have to have subtitles for the kids to understand what's going on. The kids are reading constantly. So it's a, it's a quick win for every parent out there. Turn on the closed captioning. And that way, uh, it's great. Boys love it, especially when they watch TV. Now they can say, hey, mom, I'm studying. I got the, uh, I got the subtitles on. No, but they are actually, <laughs> they are actually uh, improving their reading with those subtitles on. That's magical. I did not know that. So that counts too. So you're you're just increasing the 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 options of what counts. So reading counts, listening to a book counts, reading this the the close caption counts. All of these things can help people be able to improve their reading. That is that is magical. That makes it accessible really to everyone. And I think your comment about not having books in the home is a valid one because I have friends who teach in, in school districts where, where the, the students don't have books to read in the home. And to be able to say, ah, but there is something that you can read, I think just also opens a whole new world. And then having that where someone is reading, where you have the words, you know what it sounds like, and you can see what it looks like at the same time is, is very, very helpful. So Wow, those are some incredible advice. So all, all of this, what is this going to do for me? If I'm reading the closed caption, if I'm listening to these books, what kind of benefits am I going to see? Yeah, so again, it's, it, it doesn't matter what you read. What matters is how much you read. I actually shouldn't say it doesn't matter what you read because I believe you are what you read, so read good stuff. So it's very important to me. I used to tell my students, you have the rest of your life to be miserable. This year we're laughing. So I like to read a lot of funny things to kids. I think there's, uh, if you want to be depressed, watch the nightly news. You know, I want people to be uplifted. And so I, I like to surround kids with lots of positive things. Really what I'm trying to do, Linda, my, my goal is to build better habits. And you had actually touched upon it. You know, a lot of people think you have to read three hours a day to become a better reader. Those are the same people who think you have to exercise three hours a day to be fitter. No, it's those little things that make a difference. And so one of the ways that I, I deal with, with kids, it's a, it's a concept known as habit stacking, where we take a habit you already have established and you make reading part of that habit. That way, it just naturally becomes part of one's daily routine. As a matter of fact, 
I've teamed up with a, a wonderful company in Ireland uh, with my friend Dermot Hudner called Cyber Smarties. What he created was a social media platform for kids ages 6 to 12 where uh, it's basically the only people that are allowed on the social media platform are kids. Uh, adults, they're checked by the police and the school system. So the kids are on there. And let's say you typed a message to me, Linda, that said something like, Danny, I think you're ugly. And you try, you try to click send. It won't send it. Instead, you get stuck with a video of us showing better ways to communicate with people. And what we found is after just a couple of weeks, uh, kids stop writing the negative messages. We are basically have eliminated cyberbullying in Ireland, and now we've spread the program throughout uh, the Middle East. It's going into India, Pakistan, and Malaysia. And on that program are all kinds of things to build better habits. And so we have our reading program. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I, I think too often here in America, we wait for problems and we like to solve the problems after they exist. I'm like, well, why do we even let the problem happen? You know, I'm a big believer in an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Let's let's get people, you know, we we always focus on the negative. I'm like, well, that's why you accomplished the negative is that's where your focus was. Let's look at the positive examples and let's make that the example that we're going to set for kids. I mean, when I was a teacher and I had a student misbehaving, I didn't give attention to that student. Why would I do that? That's encouraging that behavior. I always made sure to pay attention to my students that were on task. A uh, simple little thing I used to do is I always refer to a student that's on task. I always refer to them by their first name. Kids that aren't on task, I never use their first name. You know, one of the sweetest words in people's vocabulary is the sound of their name. They want to hear their name. And people are going to go for attention one way or another, either positive or negative. So you have to build the habit of how to how to create positive attention. You do that with encouragement and reinforcement. It's the same thing with reading. I mean, uh, I'm always finding things. I had a little boy. I went into a classroom, a uh, third grade classroom, and the teacher said, Mario won't read nothing. I'm like, oh, I'll get Mario reading within an hour. I was wrong, Linda. It actually only took 20 minutes. And the book that I gave Mario, he he liked it so much, he memorized the first chapter by the next week. Now, the book was called Just Disgusting by Andy Griffiths, not the Sheriff of Mayberry. This is an Australian author. He wrote The Day My Butt Went Psycho. And the, uh, the first chapter in the book is called The 101 Most Disgusting Things. I don't remember all of them, uh, but I remember some of them. So it's like, number 12, dog poop. Number 13, Stepping in dog poop. Number 14, <laughs> trying to wipe the dog poop off your shoe and get it on your fingers. Number 15, eating a hot dog that tastes like dog poop. Number 16, realizing the hot dog tastes like dog poop because you forgot to wash your hands. That's how you get a little boy excited about reading. I mean, I, I tell people, don't get me wrong. I think Little Women is a wonderful book. But if you want a little boy to read that book, you better put diarrhea in the title. I mean, we're just talking different <laughs> different things all the time. But this is how we do things. I mean, people are drawn towards things that they like. Um, I'll give you an example. My wife and I were finishing dinner one night. My wife's like, you want some more green beans, honey? I said, oh, honey, I am stuffed. I couldn't eat another bite. She said, we got chocolate cake for dessert. I said, just a small slice. You know? <laughs> always find room for things that you like. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's you know this, Linda. You find things. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to sell the kid on reading by always making reading the as a teacher for for PE. I would make the kids do calisthenics and they'd run sprints and stuff. For for reading time, we put on music. They could read with their friends. They could eat and drink. They could lay on the floor on pillows with stuffed animals. And so then whenever we had free time, I'd say, kids, what do you want, P.E. or reading time? And they're like, reading, reading, reading. You know, I'm, a really, I'm a really bad PE teacher, but we'll deal with childhood obesity in another time. Right now, I want to get the kids to, to be reading. It's, it's very easy, you know, how to create a positive sensory experience that people enjoy. I, and this is one of the things I see happening in schools. I don't understand why we assign books to kids. I mean, what? who's to say what good literature is? I mean, you and I could have totally different opinions about what what's good to read. I mean, I, when I was in high school, I was forced to read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which is the story of Hester Prynne commits adultery, so she has to wear an A on her chest. And I asked my teacher if I could wear a B on my chest because I was so bored reading that book. <laughs> now, 
I'm not saying that's a bad book. It's a book that I didn't like, and I shouldn't be forced to read something I don't like, because the more you give me stuff I don't like to do, I try to avoid that activity. What I'm trying to do is always make reading, you know, I'll do a, I'll do an, a training with a corporation, and I always ask executives, what was your favorite book growing up? And I'm telling you, Linda, 70% of the room says Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, Superman. They all read comic books. And yet people think comic books are bad. Comic books are actually written at twice the uh, reading ability level as the network nightly news. There's all kinds of great vocabulary in comic books. As a matter of fact, if you look at some of our, our biggest leaders, they all read comic books growing up. And so I, I, I had a, when I was teaching, I'm sorry, I keep on going on. Linda, no, I, I love this. Keep going. Well, I had a second grade boy, Kiara. And, uh, you know, Kiara comes into my, you know, Kiara's teacher and told me, Kiara don't know nothing. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Well, Kiara, who don't know nothing, comes into my room one day and he's like, hey, Mr. Brissell, you see Barkley last night? He had 18 points and 16 rebounds. I'm like, thank you, Kiara. Because from that day forward, every day after lunch, I'd sit Kiara on my lap and we'd read the LA Times sports page together. And by the end of the year, Linda, Kiara was one of my best readers, and all that kid ever read about was sports. Now, do I think you have to expand your reading beyond sports? Absolutely. But now I've given him the taste for it. Now he's excited. And so now when we start going into those academic types of reading, he still he doesn't associate reading with misery. Now he's starting to see, oh, there's different, there's different purposes for reading. There's reading for information. There's reading for enjoyment, uh, reading you know, for enlightenment and uh I don't know. I get very passionate about this because I just think we're teaching reading the wrong way. We're, we're making kids hate it. And there's no reason to do that. You can get kids. Um, and, and I'm not putting down. There are some kids with reading disabilities and there's all kinds of great programs. I've seen uh, my friend Lois Letchford has a wonderful program. Her son was dyslexic. Okay, okay. It's a very, very good program. Um, you know, and there's there's more than that. Uh, but I would say, you know, the majority of reading problems I see are not due to illiteracy. They're due to illiteracy. We've made the kid hate reading. Absolutely. And I think the points you bring up are so valid. And the idea of learning to like something and that you are allowed to do something that you like and that it's not a chore. Now, for me, I'm a little different than most of the statistics in that I was a straight A student through high school, all grades, college, everything, but I never read a book that wasn't assigned. And it wasn't uh -huh. in my home reading for pleasure was not modeled. My mm -hmm. parents grew up um, both on farms and they were born during the depression area and there was work to be done. And a yeah. man, if you had time to sit and read a book, then you better stop and go get some chores done. And so the first time that I ever saw someone read for pleasure was after I got married and my husband mm -hmm. sat down and just read a book. And I thought, culture shock, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And And, and then and then he was reading with me and he got me hooked on this book. And I thought, oh, wow, this is fun. I'm reading a book for fun and it's allowed and I can do this. Book? It was The Power of One. Oh, good book. It I'm is. sorry, I, just, I, I had to ask. Keep yeah, going. it was excellent. So anyway, um, just the idea of what was what was modeled and what we see. So you as a, as a teacher and an educator and as a parent, you have the opportunity to model. This is a fun thing and we're allowed to do fun things and to be able to enjoy. And that message that just reading for enjoyment does the trick. It doesn't have to be sit down and be miserable. When I was in high school, I honestly thought the definition of a classic was a book that was so boring that only really smart people could get all the way through it from the beginning to the end. And it, you know, if you read Moby Dick or you read this, that, or the other, then all of a sudden, you know, that meant you were smarter because you were able to get through the boring stuff. And that's I'm sure not the message they were trying to get across, but that's what I learned. And it took being able to read something that was fun before. Now, I've been in a book club for 20 years. I love it. I enjoy it. I spend time, you know, and I modeled that for my kids to make sure that they understood this is a good thing. This is something that you want as part of your life. And so hopefully that's a, a little bit of an improvement. But isn't well, it I interesting? Could, I could kiss your husband because that's one of the things that drives me nuts is that I don't see enough dads reading to their kids. And, uh, you know, and I love that he read to you, too. I mean, I have a wife and three kids and we all have different books that we read together. So my wife and I are reading the Outlander series together. She's interested in that. So it's a nice way for us to connect. Uh, my oldest daughter, um, 
these shadow and bones series is what she likes and so we've been reading those together my son he's into the civil war so we're reading the killer angels by michael shira he loves that and then my youngest daughter we're reading around the world in 80 days together uh, one of my favorite books by jules Byrne. uh but you know and that's one of the things i do with kids all the time is i'm 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 advertising i'm like what are you reading and let, let me tell you about uh what other people are reading and uh, the kids get excited. I mean, I think the reason a lot of kids don't read is they don't know all the cool stuff out there to read. And so I'm always trying to find out. I mean, if I hear a couple of little boys talking about NASCAR, I get them some NASCAR books. If I hear a little girl talking about JLo, I get a Jennifer Lopez biography. It's uh, and everything I'm talking about applies to adults, by the way, you know, uh, I, I have one of the, the number one book clubs online called lazyreaders.com. It's a free subscription to anybody. Uh, once a month, if you subscribe, I give you 10 book recommendations, three or four adult level, three or four young adult level, and three or four children's level books, all under 250 pages. So you have something you can read when you're stuck in a boring meeting or something. Cause again, People, when they think of reading, they think it's Dostoevsky, War and Peace. I'm, like, I'm not going to get through that kind of book. I, I like short books. I like I like things that I can read on a plane. Uh, when I was a middle school teacher, I was the only teacher at my school that never had any tardy students because I always started class by reading aloud a Paul Harvey story. I, I would, When I was growing up, uh, I used to listen to Paul Harvey on the radio. He passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 325 years old. Uh, but, <laughs> Paul Harvey used to come on at 1215 every day and say, I'm Paul Harvey with the rest of the, the story. story. And he'd do these five minute stories. And the whole time you're trying to guess who's he talking about or what company is it he's talking about. And that my students used to love that. Uh, and the last book that I wrote, The Leadership Begins with Motivation book, the reason I wrote this book was because Paul Harvey stories I, were I was telling my students you know, when I talk about like the founders of Sears Roebuck, you know, kids in 2021 don't even know what Sears Roebuck is. And so I'm like, oh, I have to write my own book and I have to update it with people that the kids are familiar with, like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and, uh, you know, uh, Beyonce, people that the kids are, oh, OK. Um, and I, I think that's how you get people hooked on reading. You find out what they're interested in and then you just, uh, you know. Warren Buffett, I tell people, Warren Buffett reads 10 hours a day, and I guarantee you he's not reading French romance novels. He's reading business reports and portfolio. He, he, he's very narrow in his reading. If a person wants to be a good leader, I tell him, well, why don't you read books on leadership? You can read John Maxwell books. You can read biographies of politicians and business leaders. You know, uh, that's what you should be. If, you're, if you want to be a good quilter, read about quilting. I, in my book club, at one point, I had a lot of uh, women asking me for, for cookbooks, and so I started reading all these different cookbooks and, and food review books. I mean, I would have never been – I actually read Paula Dean's book was great, and I love Anthony Bourdain, and uh, uh, there's a, a, a food critic for the New York Times, Ruth Reichel, I think is how you pronounce her name. She's wonderful. I would have never read that if, if people hadn't had said, hey, can you give us some recommendations – of uh, cookbooks and so that's that's what I, I get excited about that all the time but I'm I'm listening I it's got to be based on your interest that's magical okay so you have the reading recommendations through your book club and yep. then you also have some reading recommendations don't you through the read lead and succeed that one as well yeah actually website? and what I'll do is uh, I actually changed the website because I wanted to add extra stuff for you and everybody in the audience so if you go to freegiftfromdanny.com again freegiftfromdanny.com I'm going to give everybody a complimentary e-copy of my book, Read, Lead, and Succeed, which is a book I wrote for a school principal who was trying to figure out a way to positively engage his faculty every week. So I said, okay, I'll write your book. So every week I give you a concept, an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy because you're an adult. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation that demonstrates the same concept. You can read that in five minutes. But I'm also going to give you uh, access to a five-day reading challenge I did recently with about 700 parents online where every day for five consecutive days, I get on for an hour and give you all kinds of tips on how to get your kid to read more, read better, and most importantly, love reading. It gives you, a, it whets your appetite for the reading habit program that we run online. So those are gifts, uh, you know, trying to get more and more people uh, positively engaged in reading and uh 
uh, I just love that uh, you're allowing me to use your platform, Linda, to really spread that joy. I'm so glad. There's no no doubt now why you are the leading reading ambassador because you make it fun and you make it accessible and you make it something that we want to do and we do things that we want to do. And that's magical. So thank you for what you're doing and changing lives. When we read, it makes a difference. Once we get out of school and it's just reading for our betterment, not because someone is telling us that this is what you have to do. I think that's when it's really magical, when it becomes a lifelong learning process. Because if we stop learning after, you know, high school, there's a whole lot of wasted life going on. I agree. The happiest day of my life, besides my wedding day, was when I got my PhD. My wife asked me why I was grinning so broadly. And I'm like, because from now on, I pick the books. <laughs> That's what I think reading should be, is you pick the... And it doesn't... And actually, I, I, I feel bad. I've been saying books the whole time. Magazines count. Newspapers count. You know, uh, when I found out that Oprah, one of the ways she taught herself how to read was reading the... the the canned foods in her in her pantry. I'm like, my goodness, that's unbelievable to me. Uh, so there's all kinds of different uh, uh, print that, you know, probably the most common question people ask me now is, uh, what do you think, Danny, uh, Kindle or physical books? And my answer is yes. You know, whatever, whatever turns you on. I mean, I like physical books because I'm old at this point. You chop off my head, you count the rings. I've kind of gotten there pretty <laughs> old, but my, my wife, she loves her Kindle, and I can make all kinds of arguments on why the Kindle is wonderful. I mean, my wife is from Singapore, and every time we fly to Singapore, I'm packing 20, 20 books in my bags, and she's packing a device that weighs less than a pound that has access to the entire world's library. Secondly, uh, we both like to read in bed, and I always have to have my lamp on because I'm reading a physical book. Her, her Kindle illuminates itself, so she never needs that. And then third... Again, I'm getting old. I can't read a lot of things. Uh, well, with a Kindle, it's nice because you can actually adjust the font size so somebody like me can actually read a Kindle. So, I, I mean, I, I tell people, you know, we, we have to have a broader definition of literacy. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, these – I love your story about the classics. You sounded just – I think Mark Twain had a, a quote to that effect that uh, the classics just – you know, the de by definition, are just boring. And I'm, I, again, I, I tell people, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'm not going to just put down classic literature. But um, I was doing an interview with uh, a Nigerian television the other day, and there's a, a huge a literacy problem in Nigeria. And I said, I think one of the reasons is because Nigeria uh, was a British colony until about the 1960s, but it still uses a British. Uh, education system to this day. And so the kids are having to read Charles Dickens and Jane Austen and William Shakespeare. And there's nothing wrong with any of those authors, but wouldn't it be more powerful to a Nigerian kid to read something by a Nigerian author like Chinua Achebe, somebody that actually experienced the experiences of that child? I, I think that's very important and we don't consider that often enough. That's so important. And I think that the, the introduction and the getting people excited level is what you're talking about, where you have to catch somebody and get them interested. My, my current definition of classics is not that. As I reread these books that I was forced to read in high school, I love them and I can see the value and I can enjoy them. But at the time, you know, I was young, I was not interested and it was, I was tested on everything and it just, it was scary. I thought, I don't read stuff because then they test you on it. But now I, I really love it for itself. Just, just the enjoyment and I can see the, the, the depth and the power of it. But I think that the idea of getting someone started is huge. You know, they talk about, you know, a journey of a thousand miles takes, you have to begin with the first step, that first step. And if we trip up on the first step by making everything miserable, nobody wants to go a thousand mile journey because it's awful. But if it's fun and you're bouncing and skipping and dancing and singing along the way, you really can get a thousand miles and have a great time doing it. Well, and I... I think, you, well, you made a point I like there, Linda, is that uh, you can read at different points in your life and get different points of view based on, you know, I always tell adults you should reread your favorite children's book as an adult, you'll get a different take on it. I mean, Dr. Seuss wrote the Lorax 50 years before anybody was paying attention to the environment. Uh, one of the reasons I'm always emphasizing, I do this with corporate executives, I say, read children's books. You know, before I go to parties, if I want to look intelligent, I'll stop by the bookstore, go to the children's section. 
And I'll read quick little 32-page picture biographies of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Oprah Winfrey. And then at the party, I sound like this intelligent person that knows all these things. I I just read it in a children's picture book. And usually, (laughs) a a perfect example of that was Jackie Robinson. I read a children's picture book on Jackie Robinson, and it got me so interested. I've now read about nine different adult-level books on Jackie Robinson. He's a fascinating person to me. I mean, you at the very beginning of the of the podcast, you were mentioning uh, Ben Carson. His book, his book, Gifted Hands, is a, just a, a must read. It's a wonderful book. And what a lot of people for, don't realize in that story is his mother, who was forcing him and his brother to uh, do all, read all those books and do all those book reports. She couldn't read. Right. She herself could not read. She so is. she was looking at those book reports every week, giving a scowl to Ben. She couldn't read that book. <laughs> I mean, and that just shows, and I've taught plenty of parents how to get their kids to read, and even the parent didn't know how to read. And what I like is I'm trying to figure out a way of getting the kids to be able to teach the parents how to read, because I don't think anybody, I I, I can't imagine a world where uh, I couldn't read. I think of that Twilight Zone where Burgess Meredith runs the bookstore, and he just wants to be alone and read, and uh, it's the apocalypse, and everybody dies except for him, and he's so happy he's in his bookstore. But uh, he accidentally steps on his reading glasses, <gasps> and he can't read. <laughs> oh, it's free. You know, I mean, I think I think President Reagan. That was one of his quotes. Was his his biggest nightmare was being stuck in a motel with nothing to read. <laughs> 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 That's the same. I, I, I'd be my biggest nightmare would be being on an airplane without being able to read something. I mean, you can only read the uh, the vomit bag and the airplane magazine so long before you're uh, you're onto something else. Uh, but uh, and I, again, I think that people also need to read things that uh, lift them up. I, I don't like negative things. There's, I mean, this is kind of a policy for me. Is uh, one of my mentors, Charlie Tremendous Jones, said. You're the same today as you will be in five years, except for two things, the people you meet and the books you read. So I always tell my kids, make sure to make wise choices and surround yourself with people that lift you up and make sure to fill your mind with really great reading materials. Thank you. And that's what we're trying to do today is to lift people up and encourage them to read and to be able to incorporate that into their lives. And thank you so much for visiting with me today and for sharing your wisdom. I love it. I'm excited. I'm ready to go pick up some new children's books at the library so that I can sound a little smarter. Thank you so much, Linda. I, I'm a big fan of your podcast. Again, we need more positivity in the world. You're spreading joy, and uh, I, I hope uh, uh, you continue to do this a long time. Thanks for all that you do to serve people. Oh, thank you. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by author Garrison Keeler. He said, a book is a gift you can open again and again. Today, I invite you to open a book and enjoy the gifts inside. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller, You Got This an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.